Hallelujah. So as we are in the series of See Beyond, I'm going to be talking about seeing beyond. And you guys see here like a, a few tables and chairs that I put here, but there is a reason why they are here. And uh, as I dig in into this message, so now when I was a kid, uh, my parents would invite people over. And when people would come over, my parents would prepare two tables, a kid's table and an adult's table. And they will put me and my brother and all other kids that were there, right? They will put them into the kids. They will put us into the kids' table. I hated it because the kids' table were so empty and there were just some plates there and they'll put some food there and just be quiet. But the adults' table was so beautiful and was set up so nicely that I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait until I, I, I grow up so I can sit at the adults' table. But lest I knew how much work do I need to sit at that table. Now, when we, are, uh, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior in our heart at the very beginning, we are baby Christians, right? And uh, as a baby Christian, we need milk. We need, the, we need the milk of God in order to grow thereby, right? So let's go to the scripture of 1 Peter 2nd, second, 2nd. Second. And it says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So now as young Christians, we receive the word of God and we start growing. And there we actually see for the very first time who God is. And we see like the love that he has for us. We see his identity and we see his heart for us. And we get to know ourselves in him, who we are in him, right? And then we learn more about his peace. We learn more about his planning for our lives. Now, as for me as a baby Christian... It was hard. Actually, I was not very excited to move from this table to that table. Actually, I did not want it. You know why? Because at this table, I was very comfortable with this bottle. These are very small chairs, but I'm going to sit here. I was very comfortable at this table to stay and sit and play because when I was at this table, everybody would be so nice to me because I was a baby Christian, right? They will, they will support me and they will love on me. And even though I was, I was a mess, they will still be so nice to me. They will say only good words to me. And they will, I was like, wow, in heaven, right? And then it was very comfortable for me to stay at this table and the reason why I did not want it to move there is because there's so much work and I didn't want to put the work to it. That's why I wanted to stay here. Now, what is wrong when you see a grown-up woman drinking milk? Something is wrong there, right? And people will say, that's insane. You look ridiculous. And not only that, but you are growing unhealthy. You cannot be a grown-up person and drinking milk and you expect that everything will be fine and you are going to be an unhealthy Christian. Right? So how many of us are, as adult Christians, as grown-up Christians, that we want to suck the baby bottle for so long just because we don't want to move at that table? Right? I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> now, people... Well, let me say this. I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit there for the rest of my life. So you turn to your neighbor and say, let's see beyond. Let's see beyond. Let's see beyond. Hallelujah. So how do we move from this table to this table? What is the bridge? The bridge to move from this table to this table is the word of God. Only this book, which is called Bible, will take you from this table to the next table. But in, 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 in order that the word of God will be effective in our lives, we have to check what? The conditions of our heart. So let's go to one of the most important parable of Jesus, which is in Mark and parable of the sower. Let's see what Jesus is telling us in that parable. So let's read from Mark 4, from, from verse 3 to 9. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew 
It, it came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some hundreds. Then Jesus said, whoever is here to hear, let them hear. Amen. In this parable, Jesus is teaching us that the God's word is like a, is the incorruptible seed, right? And our heart is the soul where the seed needs to be implanted. Now, the condition of our heart is going to determine the outcome of the God's word into our life. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stay a little bit here. I'm going to explain. So if you can put my points, the first one. So we are going to talk about all the conditions of our heart, which are four that Jesus talks in this parable. Okay, so the type of soil are the condition of our heart. The first one is hard, uh, hard ground, right? Hard, uh, uh, in hard ground are those people that have the kind of heart which they hear God's word but did not understand it. The second one, heard God's word but did not believe it. The third one, heard God's word but unwilling to respond to it. These are people which have that, that, that kind of heart, which is called hard ground. When Jesus talked about stony ground, the rocky ground, let's see what he says here. Those people that hear God's word and receive it with gladness, but persecution came and they fall. Hardness came and they fall. They're like, ah, no, I can't do this. The second one does not allow to take root. So they do not allow the word to take root in them. The third one, make a shallow commitment to it. And the fourth one, affliction, persecution, or trouble can uproot the word. The third one, thorny ground. Jesus talks about thorny ground. So when I am talking about this and I'm listening, I'm reading this, just pay attention where do you fall into. Because this is real. Where do we fall into as Christians? Thorny ground. Are those people that hear God's word, but the cares of the world is suffocating it. Deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, choke the seed and it, and, it, and it doesn't produce any results, right? No fruits whatsoever. But the good ground is the last one that Jesus talks about. That's the good soil, the good ground. And Jesus says, those people have this kind of heart, who hear God's word and accepts it. Protects the soil from hardness, rocks and thorns. And this kind of heart, when you receive the word, it produces results. 30-fold, 60-fold. And 90 folds. So what the kind of type of soil you want to be? Good ground, right? Now, how can you be a good ground? How can we be a good ground? You know, how can we be a good, a good ground? If you receive this word, the word of God, like the little children. Let's go to, to Mark. Mark 10 from 14, 15. You know what God says? Jesus saw this. He was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as this. Look, look, it gets better. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like the little children will never enter it. Isn't that nice? Isn't that good? It's a very powerful verse, and I know it's a very strong verse that Jesus is saying to us here. But you know why? Because most of the time we doubt the word of God. We take it and we go like, nah, this is not for me. I don't think God loves me so much that he wants to heal me. What is it? God loves me so much that he wants to bless me financially? No. I have been always poor. My parents have been poor. My grandparents have been poor. All my family line has been poor. God is going to bless me. No, that can't happen. So we doubt the word of God. And then what does God say? Can you just keep the scripture? Truly, I tell you that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, the word of God, like a little child, will never enter it. That's how powerful it is. Will never enter it. That's how strong God speaks to us about his word. And you know why God takes a little child and he compares it with a little child? Because a little child believes so genuinely. So genuinely. He takes and receives the word of their parents and they believe in it. Everything that we say to them, they believe it. Like, wow, really? And when they go to the school and they defend it. They go to schools and they try to go, come into argument with, uh, with other kids, right? And then they go like, no, my mom and dad said this and it's like this. And they will defend it. And that's how God said, that's how we need to be with the word of God. We need to defend it. We need to believe it, take it, receive it, and defend it. 
Because then it's going to break into our lives. Amen. And this, how, this, is, this is how we become a good ground. And when we become a good ground, we produce good fruits. So the others can see and others can know Jesus through us. So let me tell you this. Satan's greatest weapon, you know what it is? Man ignorance about the word of God. That's his greatest weapon. To keep you ignorant about the word of God. Because if you keep you e ignorant, you are defeated. You are defeated. No matter how much you try to pray, you are defeated. Because only this can bring you to that scripture. To enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? So please, do not be trapped to sit at this table for the rest of your life because you are not willing to put the work of studying and meditating the word of God to go to the next season of your life, to the next table. Amen? Amen. So how, uh, uh, when I decided to see beyond, to move from this table to that table, right? Not everything was like, wow, nothing is going to hit me, nothing bad is going to happen to me. Let's go to the Psalms 23 verse 5. What God says, God says, I'll prepare before you a table in the presence of, of your enemies. So let me make it clear at the very beginning when I talk about the enemies, we're not talking about people. Because we are not fighting against flesh and blood, we're fighting against principalities of darkness in the heavenly realms. We love people, we're called to love people and pray for people, amen? So now when God says, I'm preparing you a table in the presence of your enemies, I'm preparing you a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Now, when God says this, he says that I am sitting here with you at this table. But it's not only me who sits at this table, says the Lord. Sometimes you will have enemies sitting here with you. You know who are your enemies? Insecurities, doubt, depression, stress, anxiety, gossips, unforgiveness, bitterness. All sorts of stuff you're going through, financial struggles, divorces. Everything that you are going through will sit around with you. But God says, I'm preparing that table before you in the presence of your enemies. And they are sitting right, right there with you. But now at this table, we learn how to keep our eyes in Jesus the whole time. At this table, when we keep our eyes in Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is the word, right? So we, we learn how to keep our eyes in the word of God when we are at this table the whole time and the word is the one that is going to sustain us the whole time at that table all right now when you when you take this book and you study the scripture and you keep your eyes focused on the scripture you will learn god will teach you you will learn how to read your enemies as a sign that now it's time to eat You learn to read your enemies that now it's time to eat. To eat what? The word of God. So what do I mean by that? At this table, you don't drink any more milk. You eat solid food. Now let's go to Hebrews 5, 30, 13 and 14. And let me, and let me tell you what, what God means by solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is still a baby. That person does not want to learn about living a godly life. Solid food is for those who are grown up. They have trained themselves to tell the difference between good and evil. That shows that they have grown up. So at this table, we learn how to show the, to, to tell the difference between good and good and bad, right? Between good and evil. And we have a choice to choose what is right. Because God has already shown to us through his word, right? So at the moment that the insecurities is going to hit you, what do you do? You see that, oh, now it is time to eat. That sign that now it is time to eat. So what do I do? I go to the scripture. I open it up. And I go to Philippians 4, 6, 7. And what does that say to us? Don't be anxious about anything when you are insecure. Oh, Lord. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And peace of God will transcend all understanding. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So how do you do that? You take that word, you meditate on that word, you receive that word like a little child, and you believe on that word. 
and you believe on that word, and every thought that comes to you against that word, you take the captive under, under the obedience of Jesus Christ. Amen? So now when addiction hits you, what do you do? It's time to eat solid food. So where do we go? We go 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 14. Let's read that. No temptation has overtaken you. Expect what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can endure it. When someone has done something wrong to you, which is the most common thing, and it's so hard to forgive, what do you do? It is time to eat. It is time to take the solid food found on the scripture. What does it say in Matthew, in, a, in, a, in a Mark 11, 26? But if you do not forgive, neither I will forgive you, says the Lord. And that's how strong it is. That's how God is very serious about forgiveness. You know why? Because we sin a thousand times a day and a thousand times a day forgives us. And we are not willing to forgive Someone that did something wrong to us. And forgiveness is not about other person. Forgiveness is about us. You always have to know this. I will stop here just a little bit because I, I know that this is going to speak to somebody here about forgiveness. Let's go to Matthew 5, 22, 24. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So leave the scripture here for a minute. So what God says, like leave, uh, uh, suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice near the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. So go and be, there, be reconciled to that person. So let me, let me explain a little bit of scripture to you. So when God asks us to forgive, God is not saying that we go. God is not saying like, oh, let me go uh, and say a prayer at the altar of forgiveness and I will give the sacrifice to God. What is the sacrifice that God is asking from us? What is it? Is our prayers. Right? Is our time with God. When we serve the Lord. When we come to church. Everything we do for God is the sacrifice that we're giving to the Lord. Right? And God is saying it. I don't need that. I don't want that sacrifice. I don't want to give it to me. I'm not even going to take, pay attention to it whatsoever. I'm not going to receive it. If first, if you do not go and forgive your neighbor. But when we do like, oh, God, I forgive that person, and now I'm going to give the sacrifice to God. No, that's not forgiveness. Because if next day you see that person, you feel like, yuck, oh, I can't stand this person. That's not forgiveness, right? When God says forgive, forgiveness is an action. God says go and forgive. It's an action. You do something about it. You call that person. Or you, or you do an act of kindness. Or you pray. It depends on how the Holy Spirit is going to lead you for the situation you are in. But you had to take an action about that forgiveness. You do something about it. You pray for the person as you pray for your own self. That's what it means to forgive someone. And you keep on praying, keep on praying. And when you do that with a genuine heart, you know what God is going to do? He's going to open the heavens. His spirit is going to overflow on you. And he's going to lift up every heaviness out of you. And his blessing will overtake you. And you will feel, you'll see that person. And the only thing that is left in your heart is love towards that, that person. Nothing else. And that's what it means to forgive. That's forgiveness, guys. That's when God says to us, if you forgive, then I will forgive. If you don't forgive, then I will not forgive you. Hallelujah. Now, now let me tell you this. There is a very fine line to move from this table to that table. So, for example, when we, we, we get a, a doctor report, a bad news, somebody did something wrong to us, something bad happened into our life, right? You know what happens? That we, our... Default system loves to sit down here and cry and cry and complain and why and why and why and why and why Jesus? Why me, Jesus? And you know, as a Christians in our lives, we move from that table to this table quite often. 
We do move from this table to the other table quite often, right? Now, I want to share an experience of mine. This year for me began painful. It was a painful beginning of the year. It was very difficult. I had a choice. Or to sit there and cry and complain about why. Or to go at this table in the presence of my God, even though there are presence of the enemy around me, and go to God and receive the abundance that God has for me. And you know how I did that? Every single day, I, made, I had a choice to take, or sit there or sit here. I took the second choice. You know what I did? Every day, I went to God in my knees, and I started praying. I started worshiping. I started praising. I started to fast. I started doing everything and seeking of God with my, with my uh, fingernails, just clinging on to him to receive his peace, to receive his joy. And you know what? In no time, the heaviness just lifted off my heart just like that. And I understood the reason why this happened. Why this happened? If I would have stayed at this table, I would have missed the point that my pain is not a setback. It's a setup to take me to that table. It's a setup to take me to my next season. My pain will work the purpose to take me to my next season. Guys, God is going to make your enemy serve you the blessings. You have to get that. Please. God will make those things that, 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 that conspire to take you out, to take you to your next season. And if you choose... So when you sit in the middle of confusion, when you sit in the middle of difficulties, and when you keep your eyes on Jesus, and when you learn how to read your enemies that is trying to eat, that's when you are victorious in every area of your life. And you know how you do this, and you know when you actually see. Let's go to Psalm 27, 6. When you do that kind of thing, let's see what God says. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At this sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shout of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. God says that my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me because I choose to sit at this table. I choose to sit in the presence of my God even though I am in the presence of my enemies. And you know what it says in James 1, 2, 4? It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Consider it pure joy every single trial you go through. You know why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Oh, my God. When a trial hits you, it's not the time. Whatever difficulty hits you, it's not the time to sit here and go, but why God, why God, why God, why God, why God? No, it's not this the time. It's the time to... It's a time to go there at that table and it's a time to, to call all your friends and throw a party and just celebrate because God is elevating you to your next season. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is amazing. This challenge is not there to take you out. This challenge is there to take you to your next season. Because only through trials you will be able to learn and grow and be strong enough for your life, not at that table. It's at this table. Hallelujah. God wants you to see beyond the pain. God wants you to see beyond the doctor's report. God wants you to see beyond the divorce. God wants you to see beyond whatever you are going through, financial struggles, whatever you are going through in your life. God wants you to see beyond it. You know why? Because his rod, his rod and his stuff will comfort you. Let me go to the scripture, Psalm 23, 4. So when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your road and your stuff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. Amazing. You know, God did not promise us a life without challenges, without problems, without difficulties. God did not promise that, but he promised us one thing. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. No weapon formed against you will prosper, says the Lord. Because bigger is the one that lives in you than the one that lives in the world. You know, and we have to, and his, oh, hallelujah, his rod and his staff will, 
will protect us. Put, can you put the image for me, please? All right, I chose this image. Now, what we see here, on my right-hand side, we see the rod. On the left-hand side, we see the staff. Both of these were used by shepherds, are used by shepherds to shepherd the sheep, right? In our context of our verse, how God is using it, he is using it, the rod has been used as, as a, an authority by God to defend us. So he is defeating the enemies. He is casting out the enemies from our lives with a rod. And the stuff, you see the stuff? There is a little U on the top of it, on the left-hand side. The stuff has been used by shepherd to hold the sheep from the neck and to attract them closer to themselves. So what God is saying to us in this verse he uses the road. How good shepherd our God is. Uh, Jesus is amazing. He uses his road in order to cast out every enemy from our life, to protect us from anything that the enemy are trying to come against us. And he's using the stuff to take us closer to him, to bring us closer to him. Because God is a good God. He brings security in our life. He brings safety in our life. And that's what we need to focus on, who God is. And God says that his road and his stuff will comfort you. Hallelujah. So when God is saying to us, like only when, when God is saying to us, sit at this table, God is not saying to us to, to read our enemies assigned to eat and, 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 and study the Bible, but it's when you sit at the table, what do you do? You rest, right? So God is calling us to rest as well at this table. With God that prepared before you a table in the presence of your enemies. So God is calling you to rest. You know why? Because on the scripture. I'm not ready. Because on the scripture, let's go on the, on the Psalm 23.5. God says, you prepared here before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup will overflow. My cup will overflow. So what does that mean? What does it mean that God is saying that he anoints his head with oil, he anoints our head with oil, our cup will overflow, that in this table God is repairing an abundance for us and he is calling us to live in the abundance of God at this table. Amen. Can you go to the next verse? Verse 6, please. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy will follow you. Goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. Amen. So no, nobody can move you from this table to this table. Only you can do that. Only you can move yourself. I cannot force you if you don't want to. I cannot make you. God cannot make you go there because he's a gentle God. He will not make you go from this table to the next table. Only you can do that. And when we stay at this table, and we, we, are, we, we stay at this table with a baby bottle, and we just cry, and like, and like. Sorry about that. All right. And we just cry and complain and complain and complain at this table. And what do we cheat by it? A big nothing, right? A big nothing. And then we say, God, but please do this miracle. God, but take this pain away from me. God, take this challenge away from me. God, take this addiction away from me. God, take this from me. And we just complain and complain and complain and complain the whole time. You know what? God is not going to do it because he's God of strategy. He works with the strategy for your own benefit. He's not going to do it in your time, no matter how much you cry. God is not moved by your tears. God is moved by your faith. He is moved by your faith. And there are Christians that find all sorts of excuses. Why they don't want to move from this table to the next table. Can you... Why they don't want to move from this table to the next table? There are all sorts of Christians. And you know what kind of excuses are there? Oh, I'm too hurt. 
Eriona, I'm too hurt. I know it's very difficult. I know by staying at this table and crying all the time, it's not going to help your pain go. It won't help your pain go. Only if you sit there, God can help your pain go away. But Eriona, God has not responded to my prayer for so long. Staying at this table and throwing fists to God is not going to make him move faster. He will not make him move faster. But Eriona, I still do not know much about God. I don't know much about God. And I, I cannot talk to people about Jesus. I cannot fast because I'm such a young Christian. I'm a baby Christian still. I don't want to commit it because I'm a baby Christian still. I'm still learning. And I'm still, and I'm still finding out who God is, right? Oh, my goodness. But I, still, but, I, but I still do come to church, right? Devil is not afraid of people who come to church. Devil is afraid of people who look like Jesus. That's who he's afraid of. Of people who start looking like Jesus. And you know how you start looking like Jesus? When you surrender yourself, when you read your Bible, when you pray every day, when you come to church every time, when you start serving, no matter how old you are, when you completely give your life to Jesus, completely surrender to him. That's the biggest fear of Satan. When you walk in the purpose that God has for you. Here you don't walk in the purpose that God has for you. Only there you walk in the purpose that God has for you at this table. I heard so many excuses in my life as a Christian that it's, that it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, guys, when I got converted at the very beginning in the very first month, I got water baptized. I went all in. I got water baptized. I got Holy Spirit baptized. I started speaking in tongues. I started fasting. I was, oh, my God, I read the Bible every day. I threw off everything from the past. I was all in in the word, in the prayer every single day. In three months, I went back home for vacation. Seven people gave their life to Jesus. By God using me, three months, Christian. That's who our God is. It doesn't matter. It matters the level of your surrender. That's what it matters, how fast you move from this table to the next table. But I understand that you would say, like, you know, there is, of course, a season of being here and being nourished with the milk and, 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 and growing up. But if you, as a Christian, you start finding excuses why you don't want to move from this table to this table, if you find excuses why don't you move from this table to this table, that, to me, is a sign that you are ready, but you don't want to do it. You are lazy to do it. You know why? That I know we all have dreams and, and desires in life, but the distance between our dreams and the results is called, is called action. I can take you there. God cannot even take you there if you don't want to. And let me tell you one thing. If you choose to stay here, your life will be miserable for the rest of your life. Dysfunctional and miserable for the rest of your life. Unless you decide to put the childish things away and move into the abundance of God and just rest and enjoy your life with Him. Amen. And the only way that you can do it is if you surrender. So I'm going to make a call today. I'm going to make a call because we lose a lot. We lose years and years and years without seeing the hand of God at this table. Years and years. And God is calling us, all of us today, that I want you to graduate from this table and see beyond from this table to that table. And only you can do that. And we're going to sing a song together. It's called, Oh, Come to the Altar. And the arms of the Father are open wide for all of us here to come to the place. And I'll pray for you. I'll pray for each one of you. So if you would just come here and just lay down before the altar everything that kept you at this table, everything that is still keeping you at this table, that you don't want to move from this table to that table. Because this brings you nowhere. This brings you nowhere, but that is going to catapult you to the destiny that God has for you.